shadows of the Trump presidency. As we've seen in last week. Thank you, Shaket. It's uh, a great pleasure to me, for me to be here at a, a function organised by uh, the most internationalist member of the New South Wales Parliament, Shaket Musulman. Now, there's no other member of this, this parliament in either house who's as interested in what's happening around the world. And he's a great asset to his party and to the parliament and to the community of this state. Uh, I've seen him in action over many years, and I think it's a wonderful and moving thing that someone who was a, a small boy uh, and witnessed, lived on the, the Lebanese-Israeli border, uh, saw a large number of his family killed in war as a result of the Israeli invasion of South Lebanon, um, can come to Australia as a refugee and rise to the position that he's taken in the, in the Parliament of New South Wales and hosting this gathering today. I, um, I want to talk about four big concepts, and the first is this. China is becoming the dominant power in Southeast Asia. Now, do I move the slides by pressing this one? So you've got to stay here and no, press. No. That is the lousiest technology I've ever no, seen. No, I will be out of <laughs> Okay, all right. Okay. I'd hate to have you here for my entire speech. Okay. <laughs> and it's not working. I'm pressing this. Excuse me. I'm, I'm pressing this and it's not moving. Um, sorry, the right arrow button on the... Here. On the thing. Yep. Still not working. That's the right arrow button. Okay, thanks very much. So, um, former head of the Australian Armed Services, Angus Houston, I don't acknowledge knighthoods, I don't acknowledge Tony Abbott's knighthoods, Angus Houston said this, and it's very interesting that he said it, and he was clearly speaking for the consensus out of Canberra. It's too late to stop the China program in the South China Sea. And I think that's a, an expression of real politique. That's how things are. As much as Australian hawks might want to resist it. The fact is that China is in the process of becoming the dominant power in Southeast Asia. The Philippines, which had had a lead role in agitating against Chinese assertiveness in the South China Sea, is dealing one-on-one -on -one with China. But what's even more arresting is that Vietnam, Vietnam has not opted to take the former role of the Philippines. Vietnam, as I learned in Beijing in early December when I was there, is seeking, was seeking and has achieved a range of agreements with China. In fact, 15 agreements between Vietnam and China. So one-on-one -on -one negotiations between Vietnam and China over maritime territorial disputes. That is perhaps not surprising. It's perhaps not surprising that the northern ASEAN nations, the northern ASEANs, or well, the continental ASEANs, from Myanmar to Vietnam, are dealing directly with China. But it's worth dwelling on Malaysia. Here's an interesting headline. China and Malaysia agree on military cooperation in the South China Sea. They're going to be running joint patrols. Ch Chinese private company, Country Garden, a company, a property company that invests in Australia, is building a city for 700,000 people on an area four times the size of New York Central Park on the southern tip of Malaya. Now that's a huge investment. And there are other Chinese investments also just over the causeway from Singapore. At the same time, um, China, Chinese investments are allowing 
a railway up the east coast of Malaya, linking three states for the first time. And China has made a loan to the biggest sovereign wealth fund in Malaya, in Malaysia, one associated with Prime Minister Najib. So the Chinese investment in Malaysia is significant. And Malaysia is conducting joint naval patrols, or has sought joint naval patrols with the Chinese. Um, in Indonesia, China has emerged this year as the biggest investor in Indonesian infrastructure, taking the place of the United States. To return to the northern ASEANs, the continental ASEANs, China is building roads and railways linking Kunming, linking Yunnan with Laos, Cambodia, Thailand. Thailand is well disposed towards China. John Blacksland, an academic in Canberra, conducts surveys of the Thai military. And he has found, in all his academic work, the Thai military looks positively towards China. In Myanmar, America had some expectation that when Aung San Suu Kyi would take power after the military dictatorship, it would have a new friend. Aung San Suu Kyi's first visit as the head of Myanmar, as president of Myanmar, was to China. China continues to be the first port of call for the countries of so-called Indochina. They look to China. The gravitational pull of China with its wealth and its huge population is unanswerable. Now, these are realities Australia's got to take account of. We also must take account of, because it certainly echoed in Southeast Asia, what Susan Thornton, the Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs, said on March the 13th. Now, she's an appointee of the Obama administration who's lingered on because the Trump administration has been very slow to fill positions in the bureaucracy. But she said the pivot, the pivot about which the Obama administration had made so much is over. She said the new administration will have its own language, but the pivot is over. Now, this is an interesting warning for Australia because a lot of a lot of the, the pro-American cold warriors in Australia had made an enormous amount about America's so-called pivot, they later called it a rebalance, towards Asia. And we were told that Australia had to measure up and Australia had to make its contribution. But hang on, in a flash, at the end of the Obama administration, we've got the highest official responsible for Asian affairs in Washington saying, the pivot is over. If Australia had hung all its security expectations on a strong, robust, expanding American involvement in the region to our north, we would have been caught very much exposed. The simple fact is, in the words of Stephen Fitzgerald, who was Gough Whitlam's first ambassador, to, appointed by Gough Whitlam to be Australia's first ambassador to the People's Republic of China, from 2007 on the global financial crisis, you've seen a cynic era with wealth, power and political, social and economic influence gravitating in China's direction, very marked in Southeast Asia. Now, a lot of Australians might be uncomfortable with this because we were part of the British Empire and the British Empire was the dominant naval power in the world, the dominant naval power in the waters to our north providing us with a sense of security. English speaking, and with the same values as Australia. And after 1942, indeed we're about to come up to the anniversary of the Battle of the Coral Sea, America was the dominant maritime power. Again, English speaking, same values as Australia, a big sprawling democracy, spoke the same political language as Australia, the dominant power to our north. We're entering a phase now 
where it's not an English-speaking power, not a Western power, not a democracy that's dominant to our north, but year by year, even month by month, we can see that China is occupying that role. So here's a challenge for Australia in the, to take up the title of a recent book about our position in the world, always, always suffering a fear of abandonment. That's been one of the directions in our foreign policy, our fear of abandonment. Here's a challenge for Australia to grow up and accept the reality that in this region to our north, it's not the British Empire, it's not the American alliance system, but it's an economically powerful China that is the dominant power. So that's the first big concept I wanted to share, you, share with you today, out of four concepts. That's the first one. The second one is that China is going to continue to grow, and in particular to become a middle income power in the next decade. Yes, China's got problems. It's got the problem of debt. It's got the problem of industrial overcapacity. It's got inefficient state-owned enterprises. All that's real. But one of the world's leading economists, Justin Yifu Lin, who was the chief economist of the World Bank, and wrote a book in the early 1990s predicting the success of China's growth model. He got it right, and he's been right in the nearly three decades since. He believes that China will continue its growth through the 2020s. It'll be growth at a somewhat lower level. But when I last had a conversation with him, he said he expected China to continue growth of around 6.5% through to 2020 and to have growth at a healthy lower level than that throughout the 2020s, which means we're looking at this killer fact, this unarguable fact, a huge fact for Australia, a huge fact for our economic future. And that is that in 2030, so close you can reach out and touch it, China will have 850 million more people with middle income purchasing power than it had in 2009, than it had in 2009. So from 2009 to 2030, China will add 850 million more people to its middle class. If you go away from today with no other statistic, I'd like it to be this statistic. Because in that statistic is Australia's economic future. That's like a new continent coming out of the ocean to Australia's north. With 850 million middle class consumers on it saying to Australia, send us your foodstuffs, send us your wine. We now buy our food from supermarkets, not from village markets. That's what it means to become an urbanised and middle income power. Send us everything you've got, we'll buy it all, your meat, your vegetables, your exotics, blueberries, we'll make your farmers rich, and we'll buy your services, aged care, health care, we'll give jobs to your lawyers, your, your accountants, your economic advisors, your planning and environmental advisors, 850 million additional on top of the existing middle class in China between 2009 and 2030. So how's Australia, we always ask this question, how's Australia going to maintain its wealth? How do we retain our competitive advantage in a very competitive world? Here's your answer, it's China. It's the success of the Chinese trajectory which says we're going to continue to haul people out of poverty and every year we clock up another 6.5, 6.9, 5, 4% economic growth, we're moving along that trajectory. In other words, China on a vast, a vast scale is achieving the transition that Singapore and Taiwan and South Korea have achieved. Going from poor nation status to middle income status and then aiming to go beyond that and enter rich world status. Now that's a that's such a, an interesting fact that I, 
I double checked it because I knew I was coming to Chiquette's forum and everything has got to be accurate or he'll he'll uh, throttle me. So I had my deputy director, James Lawrenson, deputy director of my think tank, the Australia China Relations Institute, go back and check whether I can continue to talk about this 850 million. It turns out that the author of the report that said 850 million more Chinese with middle income status by 2030 has revised his figures. He's, he works for the OECD. He's written for the OECD. There's a new report out, a new report out, and in fact, he's saying, yes, it's absolutely on track. By 2030, 70% of Chinese will have middle income status, but he's actually concluded it's going to be a bigger share of the world middle class than he expected when he first wrote this report in 2010. The Chinese share of the world middle class will be bigger than he expected. So China's, China's share of the world economy is spreading at the margins. No use worrying about North America or Europe the increase in the middle class is insignificant between now and 2010. It's all happening in Asia, and most of it overwhelmingly is in China. And the China, what, what gives you confidence that this is going to continue? It's the Chinese capacity for innovation. The growth is not in those old, ailing state-owned enterprises. It's increasingly in the private sector, and it's noticeably in the innovation sector. Alibaba bigger and vaster than Amazon. The Chinese equivalents are competing with their American equivalents and edging them aside. When I was in Shenzhen recently, I was speaking to someone, a Chinese company that's got smart home technology. On your way home, you just use your, get out your mobile phone and you use it to turn on the air conditioning or turn on the heating or run a bath for you or start warming up the food you left in the microwave smart home technology. I said to the Chinese company, I said, um, are, you, are you up against your American competitors? They said, we're ahead of them. They said, we're ahead of them. And I was talking to them in Shenzhen, which is the, this big city in uh, Guangdong province. Who here is from Guangdong province? Uh, big, big representation of, uh, of the Pearl River Delta. And this is, this is a province that 10 years ago produced 70% of the world's shoes. Not anymore. Not interested in shoes. China's getting out of shoes. I spoke to a shoe distributor in Melbourne at a bank function. They said, we've stopped sourcing our shoes from China. We get them from, from Europe now because it's cheaper. <laughs> they get it from Portugal and Bulgaria. China's too smart. It's got out of that stuff. Southern China, instead of producing 70% of the world's shoes, now produces 70% of the world's drones. That's the difference. And this is the transition. This is the transition in China. They're interested in this region. They're interested now. You can go to the museum in Shenzhen and you can see this transition. Deng Xiaoping went down there in the early 90s. He said, we've got to get in. He's a great southern tour. He said, we've got to get into manufacturing. So they made the cheapest radios and the cheapest refrigerators. It's all in a museum now. China, China's not touching this stuff. That's for museums. Museums of Chinese industrialization. They're into robots. They're making robots. They're into robotics. And it's that capacity for innovation that leads me to this second big thought for you. China's on track to make the transition and to have this bursting 850 million added to its middle class by 2030. And Australia should be ready for it. The next question is, the next big idea I've got to share with you is that China, China is beginning to emerge with a globalized foreign policy. The international character of China is changing. Here's an article of, out of Foreign Affairs magazine. China's a disruptive power because of its growth, but it's not a revolutionary one. It does not seek to overturn the current international order wholesale. And that's very true. Here's, here's a way of measuring the difference between the aspirations of America 
and that of China. Americans in recent years have got used to defining their greatness as a capacity to raise an expeditionary army and send it halfway around the world to change a government and install democracy. That's what they did with Iraq. That's what they did with Afghanistan. On both occasions, they failed. But that's what America does. It runs these wars, it loses them. But it attempts to install democracy by raising an army and sending it halfway around the world. If, if any one of you went to Beijing and started talking to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs or academics at Xinhua University or Beijing Foreign Studies University or, hmm? or Shanghai, or Shanghai, <laughs> where you've got the great forums and think tanks and said, hey, why doesn't China upgrade its foreign policy? Why don't you do what America does as a superpower and raise a Chinese army and send it into the Middle East to change the government and install Chinese values? If you propose that, if you propose that to anyone in China, they would have been courteous, and then when you left, they would have said behind cupped hands, where did that idiot come from? <laughs> There's nothing more alien to the Chinese than they, they, one, attempt to change the government of other countries and impose Chinese values, and two, that they raise an army and attempt to do it by force, the way America does. It's, it's just alien to the Chinese mode of thinking. In five millennia of history, Chinese like to say that, it's probably a bit of a stretch, in five millennia of history, but you can say with, with greater certainty three or four millennia, that hasn't been, been the way the Chinese thought about the world. Under the, under the Ming Dynasty, they told their most brilliant admiral to stop going and exploring. China was not going to settle new lands. In 1792, the Emperor Qinglong told Lord McCartney, the British ambassador, um, it's nice to have you here in Peking. But as you can see, we've got everything, everything anyone would want. We really don't need to trade with you. In 1917, the American president, Woodrow Wilson, said, America's role in the world is to make the world safe for democracy. We'll fight wars to spread our values. That's not the Chinese way of doing things. And that's why we can say China's not a revolutionary power. I'm just trying to move this on, Chiquette, um, but it seems to have, to have stuck here. So this, this is an important point to understand. But it is interesting that China's foreign policy is becoming more global. Is becoming more global. And some people have spoken of President Xi as a, an imperial president. Others have said, others have said he's too, too much an ideologue to be an imperial president. Others have questioned whether he's got the imagination to steer a Ch a China into a new world where it enjoys greater prestige. Those assessments will be determined by history. In the meantime, we can say with some certainty, China is striking a global note more often in its international personality. It's the third largest donor to the UN's budget and it's the second largest contributor to UN peacekeeping. In Beijing, I was taken to see a training school for members of the Chinese armed forces and civilian organizations who are being sent to Africa for UN peacekeeping purposes. It's China accepting a global role, but under the umbrella of the UN, as part of the UN. It's one further bit of evidence that China seeks to play a global role in accordance with an international order, rather than as a result of unilateral enthusiasms. As for One Belt, One Road, this expert says, this is a martial plan without a war. This is China putting money into the countries of Central Asia, and to Southern Asia, and increasingly in Southeast Asia, seeking to build their economies 
because China in turn will benefit from that. It's an exp the way to understand one belt, one road, which is a vague concept and one Australians have got legitimate questions about, the way to understand it is that China, China has had enormous success in lifting the wealth of its, West, its poorer Western provinces. So the income gap between Chengdu in Sichuan in the West and Shanghai has been narrowed over the last decade. The per capita wealth gap has narrowed. China is now seeking to move into Central Asia with the same sort of program of development, lifting living standards, spreading the wealth. And for the Chinese, this is a reality. The, the trains are moving across Eurasia. They're arriving in Turkey. They're arriving, they're arriving in Germany. It's interesting that during uh, Premier Lee's recent visit, Australia pulled back from talking about One Belt, One Road, or doing what the New Zealanders did, signing a memorandum of understanding on it. But still, next month in Beijing, our trade minister is going to be present, representing Australia, at a Chinese-sponsored conference on One Belt, One Road. This is a reality for Australians. It is a bit vague and it carries a lot of risks. If you look at investment in Mongolia or Kazakhstan, it's not immediately appealing to the, pri the private sector in this country, but it does represent a maturity and a confidence and a globalisation of Chinese foreign policy. What does China want? I might go to the man who's been thinking about this for the last 50 to 60 years. He says, while the American goal is to prevent any other power achieving hegemony, dominance in Asia, China's goal is to keep adversarial forces as far from its borders as possible. That's the Chinese goal. And that explains South China Sea. It's China saying we will no longer live with America being able to have its warships right up against our submarine base in Hainan. We'll no longer have American warships able to sail casually close to our territorial zone. This is a region that's going to be a sphere of influence for China. And it achieves the effect of keeping any adversary as far from our borders as possible. So that's something, there's some observations on the globalisation, the increased maturity seen in Chinese foreign policy. But I should add this qualification, a lot of Chinese don't see themselves as being a great power. A lot of Chinese hesitate to think of their own country in those terms. But the notion of being a superpower is, is further, further by a long stretch from their imagination. There is no ambition within China, not even a hint of it, at least until the Trump presidency, of China taking the global role of the United States. That doesn't reside in the Chinese view of China. But Chinese foreign policy is becoming more confident and is developing a global edge. The fourth and final big idea I want to introduce you to is the idea that if there's a war between China and the United States, Australia is not going to join the US. Now think about that. The evidence that we're going to pick through is not overwhelming, but there are hints in the air. An American I know who served in two Republican administrations was in Sydney recently, and he said, I think there's going to be a conflict between us and China over Taiwan. And I leaned across the table and I said to him, Dick, don't count us in. <laughs> he said, no, I wasn't. He said, no, I wasn't. And um, I think Americans are going to get, uh, slowly getting the message, and I'll, I'll tell you why in a moment. But Australia's got to make it. Australia's got to make it diplomatically very clear to America that if their paranoia drives them to a policy of containment of China, 
and over East China Sea or South China Sea, increasingly unlikely, I think, um, draws them into a conflict with China, they should be aware that no other American ally, with the arguable exception of Japan, is going to be with them. You've got, you've got a few populists who are distorting Australian policy on foreign investment. But I don't think that's going to be a serious impediment to the Australia-China relationship. I think China should be cool-headed about it, and, and China has been cool-headed about it. Um, the government said it's going to have a critical infrastructure centre that will designate the areas where foreign investment is not acceptable. And it will list what will be known as key infrastructure, and Chinese investors will know what they're playing with. They'll know before they make a commitment that might cost them millions of dollars whether they'll be allowed to buy a port or a power grid. We've done a survey, we're the leading think tank in Australia, in Australia-China relations, we did a survey that just measured what Australians really think about Chinese investment. And it showed that the Australian concern was about the share of investment, that is whether it's a 50% or 80% foreign investment, foreign take, foreign stake, and the length of the lease rather than the country of origin. And that's worth knowing. There's no more alarm about investment from China than there was about investment from India. Well, I've got to say that investment from America was relatively well received. There is a way through these arguments. And foreign investment should not be a barrier to closer Australia-China ties. The Chinese just want to know what the rules are, and they'll play by those rules. Australians always say we can be an ally of the US and at the same time a comprehensive strategic partner for China, and the Chinese endorse that, as Wang Yi did in his talks in February. He's got some more difficulties with this computer. Um, I, I'm, I'm learning to do it, so it's OK. <laughs> <That's all right. laughs> I'm becoming computer literate, even when I stand here. That's OK. That's fine. Um, Gareth Evans used a useful exp expression. Recognising the legitimacy of China's claims to be a global rule maker, and not, not just a rule taker, and to have some strategic space of its own. In other words, as China becomes a great power, it's going to have influence in its region, in this region. And that, that raises the question of whether the US is big enough to accept that, or whether the US is going to fight some battle over containment, which, from an Australian perspective, is just not going to work. Whitlam put it very eloquently when he said, we seek a relationship with China comparable to that which we have or seek with other major powers. With other major powers. A normalisation of the Australia-China relationship. Now that's perhaps a romantic notion because issues keep getting in the way because Australia and China differ in values. Two examples. Um, the extradition treaty. The Australian Parliament raised objections and Julie Bishop wasn't able to carry her own side, which is a reflection on her authority and her own party, or the difficulty of this issue. And she was reduced to saying, we'll repeal the ratification instrument and continue our discussions with the opposition. Well, at the same time, Australia signed extradition treaties with the United Arab Emirates and with Vietnam. I don't know of any real differences between the justice system and the human rights equation in Vietnam and China. But here we had something get in the way of the Australia-China relationship. The Australian Parliament found it a difficult concept to accept, given the real differences in the Chinese and Australian justice systems. Here's another issue that got in the way, and it was a stumble on the Chinese side. The detention a Professor Feng, uh, an academic at UTS, because we presume he had contacts with dissidents in southern China. So these are two examples of issues that, that, that come from nowhere and create difficulties or challenges in the relationship. 
making it harder to achieve that Whitlam concept of a relationship with China that's comparable to that we have with other great powers. But still, I'm going to conclude here, there are two examples where Australia recently has said no to the United States when it comes to the China policy. Patrols in the South China Sea, they've been urged on us by three US admirals. Now, US, the commander of the US Pacific Command, based in Honolulu, is very powerful. And he likes to think that he makes policy for the United States on Asia, and his position is more important than that of the Secretary of State. And three of them have given speeches saying Australia ought to follow America in running patrols that challenge China in the South China Sea. Patrols within the 12 nautical mile radius of Chinese claimed territory or artificial structures. On three occasions they've said it, and people in the Australian media have acted as if this would be inevitable. Peter Jennings, who's a real cold warrior, a real hawk, who heads the Australian Policy Security Policy Institute in Canberra, ASPE, has said, oh, it's inevitable. Trump will ask us to do this. Australia's going to have to do it. Well, hang on. They've been making these speeches and giving these interviews now for two years, and Australia hasn't. Australia hasn't run these patrols. Why? It's because in Canberra, at the highest levels, they've reached the conclusion that it would not be in Australia's interests. It would not be in Australia's interests to test China in this fashion. Now, that's very interesting. That is, and in China, I draw attention to what we've actually done. It is an example, a refreshing example, where Canberra, the Canberra establishment, let America down when America was hinting strongly that we should run these patrols. Julie Bishop says she hasn't been asked by Washington for Australia to run such patrols. And what she's saying is that the White House and the State Department, White House and the State Department, have hesitated to put the pressure on Australia because they sense the answer will be no. The second example is this. Obama asked Tony Abbott if Australia would stay out of the Chinese-sponsored Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank. What happened? The US President put the call through to Tony Abbott, who'd normally be inclined to do anything a US President asked him to do. After hesitating for some time, Abbott actually looked at what was in Australia's interests. China's sponsoring a bank. It's going to be a multilateral institution. China's attempting to play by the rules. China could have set up a bank and said, this is a Chinese bank. It'll make loans to the Philippines and Indonesia, anyone else, but it's going to be a Chinese bank with Chinese rules. China didn't say that. China didn't say that. China said it's going to be a multilateral institution like the Asia Development Bank. And when Australia made suggestions for governance of the bank, China accepted every one of them, a multilateral institution. And everyone's joined, except Japan. Everyone's joined. We joined, we joined just after the United Kingdom did. We should have been in there in a flash, but at least we were in there. At least we had the courage to say Australian interests. It's Australia's interest to join it. So that's a second example of where Australia has let America down, taking account of our real interests in China. You got these comments out of Americans. Uh, Chiquette mentioned some other sources, other sources in America. Um, but the fact is, this is not wrong. This, this, this course, according to the Rand Institute study, conflict between China and the US would devastate the economies of those two countries, China and the US, and it would drag Australia down as well. And I hope that when Malcolm Turnbull sits down with Donald Trump, he cautions him on China policy. But in fact, Trump is reaching that point. Trump's reaching that point. He knows he's got a deal with a near peer power, a near peer power of the US, which is what China has become. Hugh White said in a speech the other day that he sensed, he sensed that Australia would not be joining the US in the event of a showdown with the United States. And I agree with him, and that's the fourth big concept 
I wanted to put to you at this excellent forum today. Thank you.